one from Martin and then after one from Esteban, he's really happy to do that one. So that's why I put Martin together with him. Because I'm sure that will be two good talks. Um, and yes. Well, I am uh, Martin McClure and I uh, work uh, at GemTalk Systems on the Gemstone line of products. Um, today I'm going to talk about a pattern for uh, distributed applications that we call uh, replicated service objects. And uh, this is a fairly simple pattern that people may be using it elsewhere under different names. Uh, but it's one that we're finding useful. Uh, but to talk about it, I'm going to have to talk about um, the background in which it appears, which is Gemstone yeah, S. So as the fourth uh, employee of GemTalk to speak at this conference, um, I am going to deliver you the fourth introduction to Gemstone S talk. <laughs> uh, but mine only has one kind of slight transition. Um, but I do get to include one thing that no one else included in their talk, which is that we are celebrating a 30-year anniversary of this. This uh, picture here is um, of the Gemstone booth where Gemstone 1.0 was introduced at the first OOPSLA conference in 1986, uh, which as far as I know was the first conference devoted to objects anywhere. Um, how many of you were there? Yes, there. I figured you would probably be the one person beside me. Is that a picture of Georg? Actually, we will talk later about who that is. Two months later, yes, yes, we were just barely in time. But the uh, that conference was put together by uh, a bunch of hardworking people, a number of whom came from Gemstone and some other of the companies that were involved in Small Talk at that time. And of course, it wasn't a and still is an ACM sponsored conference, so it did not hurt at all in getting that established. But Adele Goldberg was the chair of the ACM at the time. But anyway, so 30 years of Gemstone, and we've been going strong ever since through up and through down. So here's the actual introduction, which most of you, okay, who, who knows what Gemstone is? Oh, almost everyone now, great. So, uh, it's server side small talk and an object database all mushed together. Um, server side small talk means it's headless, it's multi user, and it's scalable. You've heard about terabytes and billions of objects. Um, object database is one big persistent image on disk, which is shared at one time between up to thousands of VMs, um, and they share it transactionally so that when you uh, commit your changes, they're merged together with other people's changes. That this works much uh, like a merge in a, in a uh, uh, source code management system. And it detects conflicts, and then you might have to deal with them if you have conflicts. Dealing with conflicts could be an entire talk in itself, so we're not going to talk about that. What we're going to talk about mostly today is the part that I actually work on, uh, Gem Builder for Smalltalk, which this is the uh, interface product that interfaces VisualWorks or VA Smalltalk to uh, a Gemstone Smalltalk server. And so it's a, a special purpose distributed object system. And now we're back to this guy again. Um, this is Bruce Schuhart. And in, as he was in 1986. He's still working on technology that was developed by Gemstone, although he no longer works with us uh, on the small box stuff. Um, but at that booth in 1986, I picked up a white paper on the design of Gem Builder for Smalltalk, which was then called the Gemstone Smalltalk Interface, but marketing, of course, changed his names. I did not know that 10 years later, I would join Gemstone to work on Gem Builder for Smalltalk. If you can read the text that says he will be working on Gem Builder for Smalltalk projects, he's been working on uh, using Smalltalk for about 10 years. That's me 20 years ago at the time. This was from the company newsletter after I joined uh, Gemstone. So, anyway, um, so it's our interface to BWVA, and it has a lot of things. There's tools and browsers and inspectors and all sorts of stuff, but uh, it's all built on this foundation of replicating, um, uh, replicates and forwarders, which are the main ways of, of communicating between the client and the server. So the forwarders do remote messaging, and the replicates do, are a synchronized copy of an object. We're going to talk about that in a little more detail. 
So a forwarder. So we've got some graph of objects here on our server, which is up at the top. And you know, here on the slide, there are five objects, right? So in a real server, you might have five billion. I couldn't fit it. Um, <laughs> so, so we're going to do a really simple example. But we want to use these objects on the client. In fact, we want to take this uh, that, uh, this object right here. We want to be able to send it a message, and we want to be able to send it here from our client VWRDA world. So what we do there is we create a, a forwarder object. Now you notice these little lines inside these circles, those are meant to represent instance variables. And here we have a thing that has no instance variables. But GBS maintains a, an identity mapping between these two objects. So it knows that these two objects are, are mapped by identity. So if I send a message to this forwarder, or to this forwarder object, um, then that object will then, through the GPS mechanism, automatically, through using does not understand, um, it will automatically then be sent to the server object. So you can send remote messages that way. So that's a very short description of how that works. Let's move on to replicates. So we've got our, our same five objects. And we're interested in the same object there and maybe the object that it hangs on to. So we replicate these. And now we have copies of the entire tree. You can replicate, you know, if you actually had 5 billion, you wouldn't replicate the entire tree. You'd replicate part of it. And there's fairly complicated mechanisms for limiting exactly how much you want and which parts you want and which parts you don't. In this case, we're replicating the whole subtree down. And each object is mapped by identity to its server-side counterpart. So now if we send a message to our object on the client, it, it executes its behavior there on the client. And let's say that it um, manages to change, change this instance variable here by as it executes its behavior. Then what's going to happen is that GBS is going to automatically synchronize that change in state and change that the corresponding instance variable up on the server. So that's kind of what replicates do, is they're a, a state synchronized copy. Um, and then if we were to send a message to the server side when we're doing server side small talk execution, and that changes an instance variable there. So now we have this yellowish thing there. And that, that gets synchronized down to the client and we have that same change of the client. So it works both ways. They're fully synchronized both directions. Um, and a relatively new feature, and by new I mean maybe five years old, um, is that you can actually arrange for a message to be forwarded through a replicate. This is, this is new. It used to be you forwarded through forwarders and you, and you synchronized state and replicates, but you only executed behavior locally. So in that case, you could send a message here and it would arrange for the message to be sent you know, up to the server-side object. And that new ability is one of the things that we use in this pattern that I'm going to talk about. So all of this original design of, of GBS, which um, dated, really got sort of fully done in about the early 90s somewhere is an example of transparent distribution. So uh, the idea of a transparent distributed object framework is that you, you can write your application code pretty much as though the application was not distributed. Um, the framework just forwards the messages, synchronizes the state for you. You just don't have to worry about that stuff. Don't have to think about it. So this seemed like a pretty good idea. And in fact, in 1998, um, I gave a half-day tutorial on that at the Small Box Solutions Conference in Indiana, Utsla. Um, how many people were, were uh, my students in that? Um, you, you were, Elliot. Yes, you was. You were. And, and, and as I recall, it was not a very good tutorial. <laughs> and I think I remember you telling me that. And I think I agree with you. <laughs> no, 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 you were right. Um, it was not a very well-delivered tutorial, and what's worse, by 1998, many people, not including me, realized that, in fact, transparent distribution is a very bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, because in the intervening years between the early 90s and the late 90s, people went from using local area networks 
to using the internet and things like latency and large numbers of machines started becoming a reality. Um, now, even in the early 90s, the people that were the core of things, a few people at the Sun, um, they understood that there, these issues were there and, and, and you had to deal with them. Um, but uh, by the late 90s, almost everybody knew it, and I eventually figured it out. Um, so when you're doing distribution, you have a number of concerns, and, and among them are correctness and, and reliability and performance. Now, a, now, correctness, as long as nothing goes wrong, a transparent distribution framework will give you correct uh, results. You know, GBS can give you correct results. But then, if something goes wrong, if the machine fails, if the network uh, has a partition, um, you know, you get into the reliability area, and, you know, things like network partition are, and how you deal with those are far too big a topic for this talk. You can have entire conferences on that subject. I'm sure there probably have been entire conferences on that subject. Um, so we're not going to talk about that, but suffice it to say that a transparent distribution framework doesn't really uh, help that with that. And performance, once you get uh, latency into the, um, into the situation, then you don't really have the greatest performance either. Uh, we heard about that in the remote debugging talk yesterday, uh, where the first version did you know 600 or 800 uh, network round trips just in order to do to open an inspector uh, or a, de uh, a debugger. So, so uh, performance is what I'm going to talk about today. A pattern that within this framework that was designed to do transparent. Uh, distribution, how one can actually utilize those um, and actually get decent performance out of it by noticing the fact that it's actually distributed. But first, an embarrassing story. <laughs> so, a number of years ago, probably more than five and less than ten, um, one of our customers told us, we, we have this little tool, right, as part of GBS, that's a user administration tool. It opens up a little window and it shows you a list of all the users you have and you pick them and you can change their passwords if you have the authority or you can add users or delete users and you know, stuff like that. And this customer told us, you know, we never use that tool. Oh, well, why not? Oh, well, we, we, we open it and it just hangs. It works for us. Well, a little investigation later and this customer had a worldwide network. Um, so they had you know, up to 300 millisecond ping times between their server and their client. They also had about 3,000 users, over 3,000 users. And it turns out when I looked at the way that that tool was coded, that the number of network trips needed was n squared in the number of users. <laughs> <laughs> so if you multiply 300 milliseconds times n squared and 3,000 users, it would have been a month before that, <laughs> slightly over a month before that, that uh, filled in. So uh, as soon as we figured that out, I spent a couple of hours and did a, you know, a two-line change that took it down to order N. And then a little more time later, we brought it down to about five round trips. And using the new pattern, which we're using to, um, to uh, rewrite our tools, it, it should be one round trip. Um, but when the tools were written more than 20 years ago, before I joined the team, thank goodness, so it's not personally embarrassing, that story. Um, those tools were written entirely using forwarders. And this may seem like a stupid idea, but it was natural at the time because, you know, the only tools we had really were forwarders and replicates, and, repl and replicates that only synchronize state. And in order to use a replicate, you have to have a matching class on the server side and the client side so that you can instantiate it on both sides. I mean, it doesn't have to match in structure or anything, but it has to have a mapping. Like some of the collection classes have completely different structure in Gemstone than they do in VisualWorks, but we are able to adapt that during the replication. But things like native methods and, you know, who knows what um, application, uh, you know, users, uh, user profile objects, you know, these have no, no corresponding class on the client side. So forwarders are the perfect thing because you don't have to have that. Um, so, uh, so it would have been better if they'd used, you know, this pattern that I'm trying to talk about, but hopefully you remember, because the talk's about the pattern. But we did learn some lessons for that, which is really, you know, when you're doing 
everything, anything, you should test at scale, because our tests only use, you know, half a dozen users, not 3,000. Um, our tests ran on a local area network. We didn't test with latency. It's fairly easy to put together a uh, network simulator on a Linux box that will uh, delay all the packets that go through it and say, you know, route all the packets from, from this machine to that machine through this much delay and you can run your tests that way. And you need a better design pattern. So now we can finally talk about the pattern. So what we call replicated service objects is pretty simple. Is you build a service object that per performs a remote service and then you replicate it. So there, done. No, that's good. I know an example, so you can actually just tell what I'm trying to say. Okay, so this is an inspector service. So here we have this object. Um, and we don't know what it is. We want to inspect that object. And it lives on the server, and the server is headless, and we want to inspect on the client. So we build this object that is an inspector service, and it has a reference to the object itself, and it also has, um, it builds a properties dictionary from the, from the information it gets out of the object. And so in this case, it's a, it's a dictionary, and you'll see there's strings. And it says, well, self is this print string, the class is point, and x is the string that contains a zero, and y is the string that contains a zero. And then we replicate that uh, inspector service to the client. So uh, you'll notice that, that here we don't have uh, the object instance variable. Because one of the things that GBS lets you do is it lets you replicate, you know, mapping, sort of arbitrarily mapping instance variables. So in this case, we've just chosen to omit that because we don't know what this is. We might not be able to depend it on the client. We know we can represent inspector services and dictionaries. So we get this, and it's got these uh, properties. Um, and now the GUI of the inspector on the client now uses this inspector service here as its model. So it's going to send messages to this um, as it draws itself. It's going to send lots and lots of messages to the, uh, to the service uh, to get information about what it should display. And all the stuff it should display is already here in strings, so that stuff can just be done locally and is very quick, even though there are many, many messages being sent. Because it's all handled locally. So that's all well and good. Now let's say that in the inspector we modify an instance variable um, in the inspector and we, and we say save. So what we want to be doing is we want to be modifying an instance variable here. So the GUI then sends a message uh, to the client-side inspector service, and it responds by first, by doing several things in a row. Uh, first of all, it, it updates the dictionary in the client side. So now we have uh, x of 42 instead of uh, 0. And there's inexplicable white space that my presentation program has inserted without my knowledge. Um, <laughs> Hopefully it will still parse to the same number, right? You know? um, and I, I've changed the color of this to show that GBS marks this object as dirty, which means it knows that there's a change to it that has not yet been pushed up to the server side. And then the uh, inspector service uses the new capability of forwarding the message to the server by sending itself a message that says forward a message to my server component, some kind of save, probably a save message. Um, so it does that, and the first thing that happens during that is the state gets synchronized, and so now we see that this is clean again, clean color, but the 42 has been, has been propagated to the server. Um, and then it sends a message <coughs> to the uh, inspector service object. The message, that message? What's that? The GBS framework uh, arranges for that message to be sent. When the uh, when the when this message was sent to itself, it said that says you know it it says basically it's saying uh, perform on GS server colon some selector with arguments some arguments. And it is the inspector service that has the intelligence to know that if you update a, a, a particular instance variable in the object that's being inspected, a particular piece of state is updated in, in the property edition. That's correct. That's correct. Yes, it, it will. Um, right, right. So it can, it, you know, it, it collaborates with the UI um, and with its server-side uh, 
corresponding thing. So, and both of these things, the synchronization, synchronization of the state and descending of the message all happens in one round trip because um, something like eight years ago, um, I re-architected some of uh, both the server side and client side of this um, to do a flush state from client to server, execute arbitrary server code, flush state from server to client, all in a single round trip. So really almost anything can be done in a single round trip now. So we send the message to the inspector service on the, on the server, and the server side inspector service knows to then expect, ex, uh, examine the information in its properties dictionary and update the actual object as needed. And so it then uh, updates that object, and that uh, 42 is getting put into our point. This is not a realistic example, by the way. Those of you who have actually programmed in Gemstone may know that there is no point class in Gemstone unless you add it yourself <laughs> because it's headless. But it was made a nice, easy example. Um, so that is pretty much how it works. And um, so the principles of the pattern are you know, replicate all the state that you think you're going to need often. Right? In this case, it was our, our, our dictionary of properties. Um, and uh, represent the information as basic objects when you need to because you don't necessarily have the complicated objects uh, on both the server and the client. You know, like if it was a user profile that we were, that we were inspecting, then, you know, then there wouldn't be a user profile object on the client, so you can't just replicate that. Um, so here we use strings in a dictionary. You know, there are other common objects you could use. Um, and do everything that you uh, can predict might be me doing in a single round trip. So we got like all the information about our point in one round trip. So that no matter what they wanted to know about it, it would be it would be there. Um, in other cases, then maybe you would say, well, maybe one of the things that's going to be common to do is to inspect um, a subop to dive into one of the objects that is referenced from the object I'm inspecting, because that's a pretty common operation. So maybe you would you would actually create and replicate inspector services for some objects one level down, or maybe even two levels down, depending on the size of them and how expensive round trips are. But um, you can think about that. So that is actually uh, the end of the talk. So we have a lot of time for questions, if there are any. Um, in the case of a rectangle, what will be inside the corner in the origin? The, um, if you were to, you know, that is kind of up to, the, you know, once again, we don't have actually rectangles in Gemstone. So um, it depends on how they're implemented. Um, if you were, if you implemented a, you know, if you did have a rectangle, let's say you implemented a rectangle on, uh, in Gemstone, and you said you had four instance variables, top, left, right, and bottom that were integers. And you were uh, replicating a rectangle to a, to a client small block that contains two points. Then, then in GBS, you would actually uh, insert a bit of code that's, that did the transformation between those during replication. Um, because it's not a straightforward, uh, just map this instance variable to that instance variable, you have to actually create Three objects, two points, and a rectangle when you're replicating from the server to the client. But if you have two uh, points inside the tunnel, that they will represent by another inspector service? Um, you could, you know, you're free to design your inspector service however you like. The the simple design here, and I think the sim I think the simple design probably works pretty well, would be that you have one inspector service per object that you want to inspect. So. Uh, because that, you know, that just keeps the design simple. And the, the, because the inspectors work at human time, the overhead of having multiple inspector service objects is probably not great. So yeah, I'd probably keep that design. I mean, we're, we're not having multiple objects inspected by the same inspector service. So, 
And we are also developing debugger services and so on, and browser services, and those can get much more complicated than the inspector service. Neil. Uh, am I understanding right that you're actually distinguishing parts of your object? So you're, you're choosing where you're going to dive, you're choosing what parts of the state. Or, I mean, is, is, is the pattern one that requires no modeling? Or should I actually be thinking of myself as, as doing a degree of, of modeling of my object structure? But this it matters and that doesn't. The, I would say yes, you do well. For the pattern, are you talking more about the pattern in general or about the inspector service in particular? Um, I guess I'm talking about the pattern in general. Okay. Um, I mean, you're, you're giving the example of just one inspector service per object and presumably right. could simply take round trips on its whole stage. But I'm wondering if perhaps that's, that's simply an example of something that you would normally model. Right. Yes, I think that what is important to model is the is the client server inter, you know, the distributed interaction is to be able to say, you know, this is where we're drawing the dividing line, these are the responsibilities of the of the one side, these are the responsibilities of the other side, um, and to know at what points you need to actually communicate between the two sides and make those points as, as infrequent as possible by effectively caching. You know, it's it's a like like most performance things, it's a batching and caching thing. So you, 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 know, you get a whole batch of things that you think you might need that are relatively inexpensive to bundle together with the whole round trip and, uh, and then use them as you need. Okay, so the modeling of the structure is very much subordinate to the modeling of this, this how do I, I'm picking bits of structure that I'm gonna take in a round trip. Right, yeah. Yeah, you, model, you, model your, you model your problem uh, and, then you, and then you use the pattern to to uh, uh, to make that performant uh, across uh, a connection with some latency. Anything else? Um, could you explain a little bit more about the single round trip that solved things that before required more round trip? Oh, sure. So we... Um, some diagram, okay. Um, so it used to be the case you know, that, the, that the API that was provided by the Gemstone library, um, when we would modify something on the client and we would want to send it to the server, we would, we would make one call and say, um, well, in very early days, before my time, I think it was, you know, send, you know, send this bunch of objects to the server and update a bunch of objects in the server. And we have a, uh, a thing we call a traversal buffer that uh, contains a binary representation of, uh, of a lot of objects. And uh, yes, I see Valeria nodding. She's, she, has worked with, she has worked with this um, a long ago. Uh, and uh, so that would be one, one call. And then you make a call that says, now execute some small code. And that would, that would bring you back um, a result, um, the ID, you know, the OOP of the object on the server that was the result of that computation, and will also bring you back a list of the objects that you might be interested in their changing that, that had been modified by that execution. And then you would compare that list of objects against the objects you had replicated and decide which ones you actually wanted, and then you would send to the server for a list of, um, uh, the list of objects that you wanted and it would send you back a traversal of those, and then you would unpack the traversal buffer and update all the objects on the client side. So there would be, there would be two or three round trips um, for every time that you really wanted to go and, and do some server-side execution. So in the new architecture, um, there's, some extra, uh, there's some extra state lying around in the server uh, and in the client for bookkeeping. So the... Uh, the server keeps track of, of which objects have been, uh, are currently replicated on the client. So it knows that you want updates to those if they're updated. It also knows you already have them if they haven't been updated. So it avoids sending you duplicate uh, traversal reports for objects that you already have uh, and that are unmodified. And so the new uh, scheme says, uh, 
basically the first thing you send in the server in a round trip is a list of the objects that you've garbage collected on the client, because there's a sort of a one-way distributed garbage collection algorithm going on. You send it to the list of the objects you've garbage collected, along with a list of the objects that you haven't garbage collected, but they're no longer replicates, so you may have turned them into forwarders, or stubs, which we didn't talk about. A stub is simply an object that turns itself into a replicator when you, when you touch it, when you send a message to it. Um, and when you don't replicate an entire hierarchy, that's how you trim the bottom of the hierarchy is the bottom level that you actually replicate and reference the stub objects. Um, and then you send it all the objects that you've changed on the client that are replicas. And those are those changes are detected through um, through the kind of read-only mechanism that we heard about that is now coming into parallel. Um, those are, the objects are marked read-only so that we trap whenever anybody tries to assign to them, and then we take that trap and we say, ah, mark it dirty, and then allow the, um, the update, and don't, don't mark it dirty, because any further updates is not going to get any dirtier. Um, so you send all those objects, and then you send the request, and this is all streamed all in one round trip. You send the request for, uh, for what you want executed, if anything, sometimes you don't, and then it performs that, and then the result of that execution any changed objects that you're interested come back, and then a traversal of the uh, of the result and all of its sub-objects, subject to all the trimming options that you send, um, is then set down, omitting any of the objects that you already have. So that's the new architecture. Okay. So you say replicate all objects which you need. How to how you bound? Uh, how you might bound what? Uh, how many objects? So, uh, so the question is, how do you limit um, what you what you bring back, rather than bringing back the entire database, right? Yes. So, in the case of this pattern, you you build your uh, your you build your rest of your service object so that it uh, only hangs on to the objects that you want, and then you replicate that entire subject. So that's easy. Now, in other uses of uh, GBS for distributed applications where you are dealing with a sub-tree out of the middle of your database somewhere where there are references that could go everywhere, um, the first and most crude way it's limited is that there's a depth parameter that you send every time you, you do a server interaction. So if you say depth 2, then you'll get the object itself and, and everything it directly references, and then the Third level would all be represented as stubs. To level three, then those would be replicates, and the fourth level would be stubs. Um, there's also, you can put a replication specification on any class which says, I want this instance variable to be replicated to a depth of no less than this and no more than that. And this instance variable to be replicated no less than this and no more than that. So we use, uh, we use that in certain for instance, in certain dictionaries um, to make sure that we actually get the contents of the dictionary always, even if the dictionary is at the bottom level of the replication, we say, well, there's no point bringing in the dictionary itself without its contents because then we'd have like a round trip for every single one of the contents and things like that. So it gets, uh, there's some fairly complicated code uh, in the server that does the traversals that takes all of that into account and, and does it very fast. Anything else? Any, any ideas about um, including test coverage to generate the specifications automatically? Uh, test coverage from. Say that again. I'm not sure I quite got the idea. Well, if you have a dictionary, if you get a dictionary off the shelf, you get some of the dictionary off the shelf. Oh, yeah. right. And then in the test, you know, the, 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 the programmer has to just stuff it with, with objects which are, he's not interested to me. These, these, these are like things that I would map onto uh, stuff. Because uh, uh, the actual data structure that I'm interested in is the thing that I'm structure. And then, um, and then the test replicates it. And, and you have sort of all that water, which is water crap. You could actually compute those, those distances for you. Hmm. It's just 
my opinion, my experience in Spur, where the problem is to work out how much of a, a, a building practical and primitive fails to see the all different forms is done by an analysis of syntax tree for two hours time. Right. Programming for themselves. And in this case, this is tricky because you make some change. And I think you wrote the specification seven years ago after a really good e site evening. It was wrong. Or, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to repeat that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the answer is, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was something uh, that I saw in the last... Uh, oh, well, it's gone now. Any other comments, questions, observations? No, I guess not. Well, thank you very much. Oh, wait. Yes. Okay, so the question is, in, in the case of the, of the user uh, browser, what objects would you actually bring, bring back for that? So in the case of the user browser, I would, um, I would probably still be using primarily strings and numbers and dictionaries um, in, a, in a structured sort of way, and maybe some special purpose objects. Like I might uh, make a user properties object that held on to strings and things, but it is not the object that is used in the server. So when I wanted to, uh, but but probably I would just mostly be, uh, say, you know, here's a here's a, a sorted collection of the users, and of the users by name, not the user profile objects themselves. You know, that is what the, the service would would build uh, instead of that dictionary be a you know, a list of those, and then for each user there would be a structure of of information about that user that was built using simple collections, arrays, dictionaries, uh, strings, numbers, uh, that kind of thing, and actually bring that across. Um, and then, and then the, you know, the messages that the service would understand for each user. Uh, you, know, you might have a service object for each user and a service object for the entire set of, of users as well. So that the uh, sort of when your GUI <coughs> wanted to change something about a user, then it would send a message to the sort of a service object for that user that then understands how to take the the string and number uh, information that the uh, you know that the GUI deals in, right? Because in the GUI you're just dealing in strings and numbers and lists and things like that, uh, and then push that information still in its simple string and number and list information to the server. And then the server side of the object would actually convert that into what happens on the object. The client side doesn't need to know the actual structure of the server side object. Uh, the server side service object needs to, to know how to do that translation in, in this pattern. So you would have two specialized inspector services? Yeah, the, the, the code of the inspector service on the server and the code of the inspector service on the client is probably <coughs> not the same code because they have different responsibilities. They have a lot of the same state because they're, they're replicants, but they probably don't respond to the same messages and they certainly don't do the same thing. Yes, uh, you, uh, you might. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, you know, if you're, uh, in the case of an inspector service, we would generally not, um, our existing inspectors certainly don't, uh, commit automatically when you update in one instance variable. You know, that just goes into the transient state of the object. But then, you know, all of our tools usually have a commit button on them somewhere. So, so you can say, I, and now I want to commit all the changes I've made, or I want to roll back all the changes I've made. So it's usually a separate operation, but yeah, it probably would be combined into the tool because that is a, something you frequently want to do, but not always. Good question. We're actually getting a little bit close to the end of time, so I'll be happy to. <laughs>